Hello and welcome. In some earlier presentations, I laid out various dimensions of this historical process of standardization, the thing that led to the creation of what we call Standard English. Here, I want to focus on the legacy of those efforts in terms of how they affect our thinking about English and about language in general. The guiding question for this discussion is, is this one. How does a standard language shape thinking about language? One of the points I, I hope you'll take away from this presentation is the fact that growing up and living in a culture with a standard language, as we do in the United States with standard English, that this experience affects our beliefs, our attitudes, even our very sense of how language works. And that these ways of conceiving of language, they're not universal. Rather, they're the, the product of this historical process of standardization, right? This process that began about 500 years ago in the case of English, and it changed the way that we think. As a simple example, you might remember those assumptions noted in an earlier presentation, such as the idea that every word has a single correct spelling and a single correct pronunciation. Right, remember, this was not a belief that an English speaker had prior to standardization. It only comes to be um, the way that we think about English, right? It only becomes that as a consequence of this historical process, this process of standardization. We're going to explore the impact of language standardization in terms of a broad ideology. So as a preface to that, I want to give you a sense of what we mean by ideology. The ways of thinking that are promoted by a particular ideology usually operate without criticism or even without much notice, right? They tend to be taken to be a, a kind of common sense, right? That's just how things work is what they make us think. Ideolo ideologies, they, they work best when people don't realize they're working on them at all, right? Um, as we'll see, ideology is not just a simple idea, it's a single doctrine. It's really a, an entire complex of interrelated beliefs and these ideas lead us to endorse and express certain attitudes, and they even guide our actions. The ideology we're exploring here is called the Standard Language Ideology, which I will abbreviate with SLI so that you can think of it as really sly. Um, it's a broad set of interrelated beliefs about English and about how language works in general. Um, sociolinguists uh, Rosina Lippi Green, she offers this definition, which I think hits on some of the key dimensions of this ideology. She writes, or she describes standard language ideology as a bias toward an abstract, idealized, homogenous language, which is imposed and maintained by dominant institutions, and which has as its model the written language, but which is drawn primarily from the spoken language of the upper middle class. So the model is really what we talked about earlier in trying to define standard English, right? Um, she notes the role of dominant institutions in sustaining that belief. Um, and so what do you suppose she has in mind here? Well, I suspect she's thinking about the power structure of our society in general um, in terms of political and corporate control. But she certainly has in mind the educational system as well. And of course, that's a major tool for the kind of indoctrination uh, that we're talking about with regard to language and with regard to lots of other things as well. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is walk through various ideas that represent elements of this broader ideology. Certainly one of the core beliefs uh, of the uh, standard language ideology, the sly, is the idea that having different forms of English is a bad thing, right? The variation is dangerous. Um, it's best to just have a homogenous uh, form of English. This is what uh, Lippy Green is talking about when she mentions this idealized homogenous language. Often this belief is positioned in terms of a threat to communication, right? The idea is that, well, if everyone spoke their own dialect or their own form of English, we'd never be able to understand each other, right? This is an idea that has a really long history um, in English, going back 500 plus years. Um, we've already seen some examples of this earlier. There's a long tradition of people complaining about English, and often these complaints position English as under threat due to diversity. So you might remember this quote from 1490. This is Caxton, the first English printer, and he writes, oh, it's certainly our language now use varies far from that which was used and spoken when I was born, right? So he's noticing this variation um, and commenting on how, you know, kids today, they speak differently. <coughs> 
In 1712, our language is extremely imperfect. Its daily improvements are by no means in proportion to its daily corruptions. This is uh, Jonathan Swift, an author I'm sure many of you are familiar with. In 1754, it must be owned that our language is at present in a state of anarchy. Well, that sounds bad. We'll say more about that particular quote later on. <coughs> um, from the beginning of the 20th century, in these days, the vernacular of the street invades the home. Illiterate communications corrupt good grammar. The efforts of the teachers in the public schools are rendered ineffectual by parents careless of their diction. I'm sure some of you will find this um, uh, uh, entertaining and refreshing to see that in this case it's the parents that are being blamed, not the teachers. Nevertheless, someone has to blame for this vernacular invading. And then a little bit more recently, the end of the 20th century, this is from a letter to the editor, the increasingly rapid spread of what I can only describe as angloid throughout the all-pervasive communications media foreshadows an anarchy, anarchy again, that must eventually defeat the whole object of communication. Right, so we see, again, throughout the centuries, repeated uh, attempts to uh, frame diversity of language, diversity in English, as a problem breaking down communication. Another uh, really crucial element of this ideological thinking is the belief that there's only one right way. Um, and you can see how this plays out at the sort of corollary. If there's only one right way of saying things, of doing things, of writing things, then we can't allow alternatives. Here's an example um, representing this, this viewpoint. This is from a, a, a question and answer exchange on an old internet forum um, that was uh, related to uh, the grammar lady. So the grammar lady was a, a woman who had a syndicated columnist, uh, she, sorry, she was a syndicated columnist in newspapers around the country, um, and she had a, a website and a kind of forum where people could ask questions um, about grammar, and um, there was also just sort of an open forum where people could just complain about things they didn't like, because, you know, internet. In any case, this, the question came to the grammar lady, is it okay to use can in the expression, can I help you, or is may I help you the only correct thing to say, right? Obviously, this person, as everyone, has probably heard both forms and wondering if they're both acceptable or correct. Here's the answer. Well, both are correct. Oh, well, that's surprising. Ah, but here's the, here's the rub. It depends on what you mean. In formal styles, may asks permission. So the question is, will you permit me to help you? can asks about the ability and the question becomes am i able to help you right so um they're both correct but they have different meanings so in other words this is an illustration of the one right way belief because they cannot mean the same thing they're they're both right but they're right for different meanings or different intentions another dimension of this belief is the idea um that <coughs> the meanings of words are set in stone Right, um, and this goes back to people trying to trace their etymology. So the idea is if they really want to know what a word means, and of course that's the one right way, right? It has one true correct definition, um, and that is never ending, or sorry, never changing over time, right? Um, so here's a good illustration of this from a an author, Simon Heffer, who is a British um, journalist. He was an editor for a major uh, paper, and he wrote a book called Strictly English. You get a, a flavor just from the title of his attitude. But anyway, he writes here, one occasionally reads in newspapers about people who have been died, or sorry, who have died or been injured in a car that has collided with a tree. This is remarkable because a collision requires both parties to it to be in motion. The verb collidere, the Latin verb, means to strike or clash together, and the etymology is strict. So two moving vehicles may collide, as may a car and a cyclist, or even a car and a pedestrian, but not a car and a tree. Right. So he's complaining about the meaning of the verb collide, or the noun collision, here, and saying that you cannot collide with a tree because the verb has to mean two things coming together, clashing together. Right. Uh, of course, if you look at how people actually use the word collide, you'll see that this is complete BS. Another element of standard language ideology is the belief that language use reflects morality. Right? This is uh, something we mentioned earlier, but let's see how it plays out. You can see this idea represented in how we talk about different forms of English. People often talk about bad grammar, 
or lazy speech, right? Those, those adjectives themselves I imply a kind of evaluation, an evaluative judgment about um, in a kind of moral dimension, right? Bad grammar as opposed to good grammar, just like bad behavior as opposed to good behavior. Laziness is, of course, not a, um, a positive uh, trait. An even more extreme example of this is reflected in this uh, phrase, a society is generally as lax as its language. This is the uh, motto of an online publication called the Vocabula Review. Um, it's a kind of um, online blog slash journal of uh, people complaining about other people's use of English. Anyway, I, I, I think this uh, motto really encapsulates a lot of this idea here, right? A society is generally as lax as its language. What is that really saying? Well, it's it's saying that if our language is lax, right, if we have um, uh, bad grammar, if we allow double negatives, then um, who knows how other things will go, right? So you really can't maintain any laws um, about anything if you don't uh, keep up with the rules of grammar, right? Today, it's double negatives. Tomorrow, it's murder in the streets. That's just, that's the only option. That's how that slippery slope works. So it's a rather extreme instantiation of this idea. Another component of this ideology um, is one that defines English very narrowly and really equates English, the entire language, with just the standard dialect, right? So the idea that when we mean, when we talk about English, we really mean standard English. And of course, the implication there is that it renders every other dialect as not just another dialect, but as not even English. It doesn't count as English because it's not standard English. And so um, you can think of various ways that this plays out. Um, one example that I'm kind of fond of um, is this quote here, English doesn't have double negatives anymore. So this is actually a comment from a student in the History of English class um, a number of years ago. Um, uh, a, a lovely person, but nevertheless, um, the statement here is interesting, right? English doesn't have double negatives anymore. So what does that say? Well, obviously, it's, it's referencing the fact that in earlier forms of English, in Old English and Middle English, double negatives were the norm, right? They were absolutely um, perfectly acceptable, and, and no one um, had any problem with them. You can find them in Chaucer, you can find them in Old English authors, and so forth. Um, and so they're sort of keen in on that idea and saying that, well, that was true earlier, it's not true today. But, of course, is it true that double negatives don't exist in English today? Well, um, you could ask Mick Jagger um, uh, about his level of satisfaction, right? And he, if he says, I can't get no satisfaction, is he really um, not speaking English, right? Of course, double negatives exist today. What this is really saying is standard English has a rule that doesn't allow double negatives or it treats them as wrong, um, but that's far from saying they don't exist, right? If you define English only as standard English, this makes sense, but why would you define English as only standard English? Another common uh, dimension of this belief is the kind of frequent debates that happen about what is a what is a word, what is a real word, right? So you may have heard people say such and such is not a real word, right? Um, this happens very commonly with things like um, the word irregardless, or more recently, um, you might hear people say, well, finna, as in we're finna go, uh, that's not a real word. Right? Well, what are they saying? Well, both of those are uh, words in a sense, right? They're um, uh, morphological forms, they convey meaning and so forth. They're a word by any definition that you could give, uh, uh, linguistic definition you could give of a word. Um, but what they're really saying is they're not a word in standard English, right? They're regarded as non-standard um, and so they shouldn't count as real in that sense. It's a very kind of peculiar idea. Um, of how to define what's what counts as English. Uh, another element of this thinking is the belief that language exists apart from its users, right, outside the minds of its speakers, and it also must be defended from destruction at the hands of those users, right? So the idea is that English is under threat from the people who use it. Here's an early uh, illustration of this um, in this quote from Sir Thomas Eliot. You might remember Sir Thomas Eliot. We saw a quote from him earlier, a lovely quote about, um, uh, ble uh, about leeches and how they get um, the right kinds of blood out and so forth. In any case, he writes in 1531, <coughs> um, it's advice about children um, and what they should be taught to speak, and he suggests they be taught to speak none English, but that which is clean, polite, perfectly and articulately pronounced, omitting no letter or syllable, as foolish women often do, oftentimes do, 
of wantonness, whereby diverse, several, various noblemen and gentlemen's children have attained corrupt and foul pronunciation. Um, lovely bit of misogyny um, packed in there, but I want to focus on his word choice here. He suggests that some Englishes are clean, right? He's talking about the English that is clean, polite, perfectly, and articulately pronounced. The use of clean is, is um, interesting there. And of course, that is contrasted with forms that are corrupt, right, or foul. Right, so the idea is that English exists in some ideal, pristine state until it's polluted, till it's corrupted, till it's fouled by lazy speakers. Right, clearly illustrates this idea. Another very common idea that we see today is the belief that language should be difficult. Right, it should be a lot of work to um, speak and write your native language. <coughs> this kind of thinking comes up um, all the time. Here's an example of a little exchange um, that again comes from that website I mentioned earlier, the Grammar Lady website. That website's no longer um, around. Grammar Lady has uh, has left this this world, um, and her website uh, uh, left as well. But in any case, fortunately, I copied some examples before it went down. But but here's an example um, from that. Right, someone posts this question: Does it seem to you that people sometimes don't finish sentences or questions? When I asked if the water leak had been fixed, the manager said, yes, we got done quicker than we thought. It seems to me she should have said, then uh, thought we would, right? And then someone helpfully chimes in with another example. What about the ad payless shoe, shoes errors? The tagline, you could pay more, but why? Isn't that incomplete? Right, let's think about this, right? Is there, um, so if the uh, manager says, we got done quicker than we thought, is that, in what sense is that, um, incomplete or unfinished, right? Is there any meaning that's added by add or that would be, um, is there any meaning that's lost by phrasing it that way instead of the longer form, we got done quicker than we thought we would, right? And of course, then we thought we would is even short, really it should, but we got done quicker than we thought we would get done, right? Or the, the pay less ad, you could pay more, but why? Really, to make it complete, you should say, you could pay more, but why would you pay more? than what you are paying at our store where we sell cheap shoes, right? I mean, like, where does completeness actually occur in a sentence like that? Certainly, the way the things are phrased here, um, the short versions, the so-called incomplete versions, are not incomplete in any sense of conveying what they need to convey, right? Um, but somehow they feel incomplete. And this feeling that they're incomplete is, uh, I think, um, promoted by a general idea that you should always use more words and make things harder than they need to be. <coughs> One other idea related to this way of thinking is the general idea about linguistic authority, right? The idea that you should always bow to linguistic authority, right? Respect linguistic authority because that uh, there's always someone who knows better than you about your language. Right, the idea um, that um, we're always insecure about our language, even when we're native speakers of that language. Um, I'm sure some of you have had a similar experience to what I am here when I introduce myself to people and I say I'm a professor in an English department. I often get some version of a, s a response like this, oh, well, I have to be careful about how I speak, right? People get nervous around people who are English professors or English teachers, right? Or even English majors um, because they've sort of been trained again, through the educational system, um, to think that their language is inadequate, right? No matter um, uh, whether they're native speakers, how great they are at, at living their lives and communicating every day, there's always a sense of insecurity about that language. It's promoted really by the general living in a prescriptivist world. It's a sort of historical example of some of this same um, uh, belief that we should bow to authority. Um, this is from Lord Chesterfield in 1754. It's an open letter that he published in the world. Um, and he starts out like this. It must be owned that our language is at present in the state of anarchy. That's the quote we saw earlier. This time, the time for discrimination seems now to be, c to seems, seems to be now come. Toleration, adoption, and naturalization have run their lengths. Good order and authority are now necessary. But where shall we find them? And at the same time, the obedience due to them. <laughs> 
He goes on, we must have recourse to the old Roman expedient in times of confusion and choose a dictator. Upon this principle, I, my vote, I give my vote for Mr. Johnson. That's Samuel Johnson, the guy who's writing their dictionary. Um, Mr. Johnson, to fill that great and arduous post, and I hereby declare that I make a total surrender of all my rights and privileges in the English language as a free-born British subject to the said Mr. Johnson. I will not only obey him like an old Roman as my dictator, but like a modern Roman, I will implicitly believe in him as my Pope and hold him to be infallible, right? A rather um, uh, extreme, perhaps hyperbolic example of someone bowing to someone else's linguistic authority, uh, but nevertheless reflects this kind of sentiment, right? We all believe that there's someone else or that there are resources that know more about our language than we do. All right, I want to um, close with some sort of wrapping up final thoughts on this topic. After several presentations where I've discussed some historical trends and often shared commentary reflecting my own perspective, I think it's useful to be clear about where I'm coming from on these issues, right? Um, one takeaway that people might get from hearing uh, the kinds of comments that I've made in this and other presentations is the idea that I I believe that the standards are for losers that there's no they're not really good for anything and that really people should be free to do what to do whatever they want to do right anything goes you can you can s uh, pronounce things you can use grammar however you want um, it doesn't make any difference right this is a kind of popular misconception about linguists that linguists don't believe in standards that linguists believe that every speaker should be able to do whatever they want. That's absolutely not what linguists believe, right? We don't believe uh, that there are no standards and everyone should do what they want. Um, we just want some perspective. So what is it that I'm uh, saying? Well, the main idea is I want uh, to encourage you to recognize uh, standard English for what it is. Right. Think about these questions. How did we get standard English? You'll remember, of course, standard English did not arise naturally. It's the product of a historical process, and that process was driven by actual people. Right. Um, as we've noted in an earlier presentation, the process runs counter to the normal development and operation of language. Right. This is not how languages sort of o naturally uh, would develop. Um, for one thing, they generally change over time and have lots of variation, and both of those things, standardization um, attempts to control, right? Standardization is all about trying to fix the language in time so it can't change and to limit variation so there's only one uh, accepted way of phrasing a certain construction and so forth. It's also crucial to consider what makes some things standard and what makes other things standard, right? Um, that's a question we hardly ever ask. We might memorize that this is, this is correct and this is incorrect, but we don't think about why that is, right? Decisions along these lines, decisions about what, why one form is standard and another form is standard, these are not made on the basis of linguistic criteria. That's important to keep in mind. You cannot defend standard English as superior to any other variety on linguistic grounds. It's not more logical. It's not better to convey information. It's not naturally more easy to understand, right? Standard English did not learn its place in the linguistic hierarchy. It just had the good fortune of being the form of English that was used by the people who were making decisions about what counts as standard and what counts as non-standard. It's also important to think about what standard English is good for, right? I don't want to deny that it has value, right? Standard English today functions as the language of edited formal writing. So it's certainly appropriate for many academic and perhaps business settings, right? But it's not suited for all functions, right? It's, it's common to think about an analogy with clothing, right? You have formal clothing and informal clothing. A tuxedo is good for certain occasions, right? But you wouldn't want to wear one to the beach. Similarly, if you insist on standard English in every setting, if you insist that people use standard English constructions not only when they're writing school papers, but when they're texting or when they're emailing or when they're talking in class even, um, you're doing it wrong, 
this is perhaps obvious, but I think that sometimes the framing of standard English as correct or good English, right, those labels, I think that tricks us into thinking it's always superior and should be preferred in every situation. And that, that just ain't the case. <coughs> Finally, I think it's crucial that you acknowledge the biases that are shaped by this standard language ideology that we've been talking about here. I think critical thinking is a useful skill in almost all areas of life, um, but it's especially useful when it comes to language, given how we're, we're trained to accept a lot of, really a lot of nonsense about English. This advice should have some special importance for any of you who are teachers or are training to be teachers in the future. Right? The educational system, as I hinted at earlier, is one of the main vehicles in our society for sustaining and promoting this standard language ideology. And the discrimination against various dialects and accents that comes with that is prevalent. I hope that any of you who are classroom teachers will challenge your thinking about language in productive ways. You have the ability to do a lot of good, but also the ability to do a lot of harm to your students. Even if you consider it um, part of your job to teach students how to use standard English, and I think that's a totally reasonable belief for many teachers, I want you to think critically about your pedagogy. Right? You don't have to make kids feel terrible about themselves and where they come from in order to get them to learn. Most teachers don't do this in other areas of the curriculum, so why should you approach it in terms of language teaching? Right? Why should you take that approach when you're trying to teach them about English or grammar, etc.? So acknowledge those biases, they're real, and if you want to, if you're inclined to, confront them actively. Thanks for listening. I'll see you later.